Hello. Can you wait? Can you see me? Wait. No, I can't see you. Ah, Here we are. Now I can see you. How's that? Very good. Well, thank you, Dr. Siegel, for being the ah. first guest on our Duty to Warn vidcast. Um, Dr. Harry Siegel is a full-time faculty member in the Department of Psychology at Cornell University, and he has a joint appointment with the Weill Cornell Medical School. Uh, one of his areas of research, interestingly enough, is the narrative assessment of personality disorders. Well, since we started with that, let me just go right to it. Uh, is there anything about Donald Trump's narrative that tells us something about his personality? Uh, I, I think narrative always tells us about people's personality. And what narrative reveals to us is the ways in which people make sense of their experience and make sense of social events, right? Um, the degree to which we are able to perceive other people as separate individuals or as people with their own psychological mindedness, that can be, that can be found in the ways in which people tell stories about their experiences. Hmm. So, for example... If you have an argument with a colleague of yours that you respect, and let's say she says a few things that really trouble you, you might find yourself angry with her or annoyed, but you're going to remember who she is. Your own self-worth and self-esteem is going to be really untouched by a disagreement. There might be a twinge of, hey, I thought she liked me more than that. But we overcome those more... Um, sort of childlike kinds of, 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 of fears or hurt feelings in exchange for a more mature understanding of, of other people. Um, that's one of the most important indexes of psychological health and maturity. So you're talking about what some people would call empathy? Empathy, an ability to, to have a sense of self-worth that is unaffected by moment-to-moment -moment right. social experiences. That you wouldn't need the biggest crowd size in history to still feel like a good enough human being. Well, well, yeah. Well, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be injured by any disagreement or any criticism. Certainly not by all. Or by all, <laughs> that matter. No, I think, I think the, what we're seeing with Donald Trump is an inability to tolerate mm -hmm. any disagreement, right. any criticism. Um, and it's 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 frightening because um, we've watched these self-inflicted wounds. Mm -hmm. This notion that um, three million people, illegal people, voted for him, uh, voted for Hillary, right? Is is really? It's first of all, it's it's not true. Second of all, it's paranoid, and third of all, it supports the narrative mm. that I, Donald Trump, am a great man. And any indication that I'm not a great man, not greatly loved, is somehow a plot or a conspiracy. Well, that's very well put. So in Donald Trump's narrative, he's the best at everything and the winner of everything. And so if something doesn't fit his narrative, what you're saying is it is deleted from reality. Right. It's replaced with a, a, a kind of fictional explanation. You know, I... Like like all of us, I, I've been through different phases of being shocked, frightened, um, and trying to come to terms with Donald Trump's pathology. And I have to say, during the the primary season, when he would say things like, I know more than the generals, or my book is the most important book, uh, along with the Bible, um, I'm the most religious man, I'm all those things, I thought... He's a showman. It's like, T I thought it was P.T. Barnum. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought he was just saying, you know, it's, it's like Muhammad Ali saying I'm the greatest. It was sort of like uh -huh. that. I've come to realize that's not true. He believes all those things. These are delusions. These are not um, sort of crowd-pleasing, mm -hmm. braggy lines, man. This This guy is serious about it. When he says he knows more about the Bible than anyone, at that moment, he thinks that's true. Yeah. And my, my concern about him, well, I have many concerns about him, but when I think about his history um, of really, I, I, from what I can understand, pretty sociopathic uh, business practices, not paying people, um, 
ripping people off, the Trump University stuff. What it seems to me what was going on for Trump was he was running a family business in which he could control all media covering him. That is, he could go on The Apprentice and appear very smart. And, and, and he certainly is, I think he is quite intelligent. But then in the privacy of his office, he was raging, he was delusional, he was having temper tantrums, he was doing crazy things like losing a billion dollars on casinos, um, right, in the, in the late 80s. And he was protected. Everyone had to sign confidentiality agreements. No one could talk about it. Well, what happens when someone like that then rises to the level of the presidency where there are the glass walls? He can't, he can't hide this stuff. His staff is so alarmed by him that we're seeing the greatest number of leaks in history. If I were working in that White House and had been a Trump believer, and I started seeing how crazy he was, I'd be leaking. <laughs> it, it's really the patriotic thing to do when there's a mad king. I, I want to get back to your. Well, uh, but... <laughs> I want to get back to your earlier point because this is truly one of the great mysteries about Donald Trump, uh, even among uh, shrink Trump watchers, which is this question of when is he lying to others, <laughs> and when is he lying to himself. Uh, when is he doing a P.T. Barnum, as you said, and when is he evidencing frank, uh, grandiose, and persecutory delusions? As a clinician, what are the things you look for to try to make that distinction? Because he's so slippery in that way. As Lance Dota said, there are two kinds of lies he tells, those he tells to others, the normal sociopathic lies, and those he tells to himself, which divorces him from reality. Well, let, let's, let's, try to, let's try to do that. Let's try to divide this into Let's take that division and make it a little bit more focused, right? So we know that he can lie if there is a strategic gain in business. He will lie, I will pay you so such and such and I won't. Or right? I mean that kind of thing. <laughs> right. He can make deals behind people's back. That that's 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 clear. I think the closer something comes to attacking his self worth the more that the lies start to take on the, the kind of intense anxiety and energy that any attack on his sense of self-worth triggers. So, so maybe we should, let me just take, let's step back a little bit more. So what is a narcissistic personality disorder, particularly a malevolent one? It's, it's, it's a term that's bandied about. It's certainly accurate. But, but I, think, I think the public is is poorly educated about personality disorders. They, they know one when they see one. But no one really is taught at this level of, of, at this point in our culture, as far as the culture understands mental issues and, and understands personality. Um, uh, someone with a narcissistic personality disorder is extremely fragile. They are holding together their sense of self through inflating their self-worth, through bragging, through um, getting people around them to admire them at all times. And it takes up a tremendous amount of energy because the, the person is afraid that if they don't get that adulation all the time, they're going to collapse and disappear and turn into nothing. Think of Donald Trump's boasts about being the best at everything. As a clinician, when you hear that, you have to assume the opposite is what is being feared, mm. that he's nothing, that he's not good at anything, that he has no power, that he has no worth. So to maintain distance from that fear, he has to build up the other side, right? He's got to build up that sense that he's the greatest. And, and as people have argued, he, he decided to run for president because Obama put him down at that White House Correspondence Center, which he totally deserved. I remember that moment I was watching. Oh, it was it was it was extraordinary, right? Um, um, but that led Trump had to undo that moment. Mm. He had to undo it, and then he spent the next couple of years getting himself with his brilliant media savvy. You really have to hand that to him. Um, he found his way in, um, and now. He, we're seeing someone with this kind of narcissistic fragility mm -hmm. running the country 
And I mean, think of those early phone calls with, with foreign leaders when he had that fight with us, that Australian prime minister. It's like, are you kidding me? It's, it's about time someone pushed back at Australia, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, he felt injured <laughs> Good at that for him. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime he feels injured. Right? Well, Anytime. So, so you actually raise a very interesting point. So, and I think this is where, as a clinician, you, you can add something to the conversation. What you're saying is the more threatened his self-esteem is, the more dangerous he is, and the more disconnected from reality he needs to become. Absolutely. So what I worry about is as this Russia investigation tightens the noose around his neck, because, and I will say this now, this is June, whatever this is, what, what is it, 5th? 5th. Okay. Just based on the evidence we have now, he is a Russian oligarch. <laughs> He's a member of the crime family. It's like we elected the capo of Manhattan for the Russian <laughs> mafia to the presidency. This is going to come out. This is going to be revealed. What are we going to do or what can we fear or predict as clinicians might happen with a Donald Trump under such mortal threat? Well, I mean, of course, we're all afraid of him, you know, starting a war or doing something impulsive on the on the uh, on the stage of the global stage. I, I guess for me, um, I keep thinking back to Nixon, and I'm, you know, you and I are just old enough to to remember Nixon during Watergate. Very well. And Nixon's paranoia grew deeper and deeper, and he he devoted all of his energy to fighting the notion that he was guilty. And I suspect that Trump will become more and more preoccupied. I'm not seeing him strategically, effectively creating other scenarios to distract us from this Russia thing. Because the moment anyone makes a claim against him, he then gets obsessed with it and then has to tweet and freak out and have tantrums in the White House for a few more days. Remember, every event stirs up this rage and panic. So I think it's possible, and this may be wishful thinking, that he's going to become more disorganized mm -hmm. rather than um, um, in some, some sociopathic way come up with some kind of, um, you know, um, uh, a decoy or some kind of uh, a distraction. I'm not sure he can do that. I think he'll just start having tirades mm -hmm. um, and he'll say this is all fake. I, I could imagine him asking his, his supporters to to attack local governments. I mean, I could imagine him saying, come save me and asking people to come and, and um, you know, assert their Second Amendment rights to self-determination. I can imagine that. So is the best hope for our survival that um, he will become so grossly disorganized that he won't be able to lash out in a way that could actually harm people? That seems like kind of a slim hope or a well, slim read to rest our yeah. hopes on. <laughs> we are, we are, I mean, you know, short of other people taking him out, I mean, we are kind of hoping, I'm kind of hoping his pathology deepens because I think the more overtly disturbed he is, the easier it will be for people to take action, whether it's the Senate or whether it's an impeachment or whether it's, um, I mean, when Nixon was was drinking and talking to, to paintings of presidents in the White House at night, you know, Kissinger and other people were, were keeping him from the nuclear codes and were kind of running things. Um, Nancy Reagan and and Jim Baker were really basically running the White House the last couple of years of Reagan. Reagan was really fading and only was sundowning and not able to focus. So our, I, our I, other I mean, hope my, is that his flunkies won't actually, uh, when he pushes the button, they'll disconnect it. I, look, I, I, I'm not happy about this situation. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I, some of the, there's a couple of grownups in there, I, it seems. Um, I mean, <laughs> this is... who aren't under investigation or indictment. Right, right, right. I mean, it's the foreign policy people, but then again, he does he does whatever he wants with foreign policy. So, 
I don't yeah. know. Well, you seem to be making an argument for the use of the 25th Amendment, uh, that he's incapacitated already by his narcissistic personality disorder, and as things uh, deteriorate, he will deteriorate. Uh, and become more grossly dysfunctional, and the argument for removing him under the 25th Amendment will become stronger. I think so. I, 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 my concern is that the, the public and the legislators need to be educated about what personality disorders are and what transient psychotic states are. And, and you know, when we say that, that, that he's mentally ill, if we say he's psychotic, I'm not arguing that he's hearing voices or believes that he's, you know, the son of God or I mean, these are gross psychotic states that you see in people with severe psychotic disorders. The problem about personality disorders is that there are more subtle forms, not that subtle, but subtle forms of psychotic thinking that the public isn't really familiar with. Right. Um, and these ideas in within psychology and psychiatry have only been around about 40 years, mm-hmm. right? This notion of the of people being on the borderline between psychosis and neurosis. So I think that's unfortunate. So if he says, I have the biggest crowd size in history, <clears throat> or I know more about everything than everybody, that's not the same as saying I'm Jesus, which is such a gross uh, delusion that we would automatically know he's mentally ill. So what you're saying is he has a kind of subtle psychosis or transient psychosis that we see in personality disorders that right. the public may not recognize as mental illness or psychosis. So in a way, you're really making the best argument I could think of for why psychotherapists and mental oh. health professionals need to speak out. Could you say something about that? Definitely. Definitely. You know, I, I've been... Um... I've been rooting for you in, in, in overturning the Gold War rule, and I went back and looked at some of that stuff. It was a really terrible thing that was going on against Goldwater, who, who certainly was extremely right-wing, and, um, but he was not psychotic. He was right. not the ill. If anything, he was considered one of the most charming and interesting people. He and JFK were pals, even though JFK didn't agree with him. Um, but I think it was a very conformist time. And so in the culture um, and where psychoanalytic thinkers were really dominating clinical psychology and psychiatry. And so there was this kind of overreach. There was nothing crazy about Goldwater, but the Democrats were using that to try to get Johnson the biggest, the biggest election they could get. Um, I think it's really unfortunate. We have so much footage interviews, writings of Donald Trump. Of course you can make a diagnosis based on gross behavior and acting out. Could you say more about that? Because I think that's a a mystery to the public because of this Goldwater rule that says you must personally examine the subject. Does that really fit what we know as clinicians as to how we can make a valid diagnosis, what forms of information we use? Does that personal interview standard actually fit what we know about diagnosis or how well, we even do diagnosis in many well, cases? Well, I mean, I, I mean, I think really thoughtful, intelligent clinicians always think of diagnoses as a kind of series of, six, of successive hypotheses. If I'm working with somebody, I have ideas about what their diagnosis is, I get to know them over weeks or months, that might change. Um, it's a tool. It's a tool for understanding the quality of someone's thinking, the quality of their judgment, right? The quality of, of, of how they're conducting themselves, how they relate to themselves, right? Um, so you don't have to talk with someone individually uh, to think diagnostically about someone, right? I mean, I can't I guess on an insurance form, I couldn't put down a diagnosis for Donald Trump because I haven't met him. Well, you haven't provided a service for him either. Oh, right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, then, then, then you. I get it for that, but, but as far as being a, a, a you know, a very experienced, well-trained clinician, I've been in practice for three years. I've seen plenty of people with 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 diagnoses like by Donald Trump's. Um, I, I, it's a responsibility to talk about the psychological phenomena that we're seeing, and that phenomenon is very troubling. 
Yes. It's not. A, I mean, I, I, I once heard you say in an interview that you would kiss the feet of, of President Pence, um, um, even though you disagree with him. I'm completely with you on that. I would completely with you on that. I, I, I mean, I mean, Pence is in a in a kind of hypocritical box, and 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 I think that that he tries to convince himself that that you know that there's a divine purpose to being Trump's. At, at this point, we'd be happy with someone who is just a liar. Well, <laughs> well, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I yes. I mean, I s- someone who you know who at the end of the day can reflect on what's happened, can separate their self-worth from moment-to-moment social events or the media and what the media is saying about, you know, most most politicians are very thick-skinned. They're pros. They've been attacked for for years. They don't they don't have tantrums. I mean, a couple of cra- – like this guy in, in Mon- is it Montana who just beat up a journalist. I mean, there's another crazy person for you. I mean, who does that <laughs> unless you're really – Trouble. I mean, that's. I mean, I don't. I only have to hear about that one event. That reporter. I'm already thinking. Ooh, impulse control problems. You know? right. Most politicians will will laugh when they when they go home. So what they're you're pro- saying is is that uh, behavior that we can observe, quotes from his tweets that we can read, that this is all valid information that we can use to see whether somebody, for example, if someone meets criteria for antisocial personality disorder, we have to see a pattern of lying. Well, we have documented by various news sources that he lies every three minutes. Off uh, the chart. Off the chart. Off the chart. Whatever, whatever he thinks of at the moment, he'll say. It's incredible. I'm, you remember that on the plane, it was with, with, when the Mi- Michael Flynn thing started coming out? And it turns out he had lied to Pence. And they stopped Trump and, say, and Trump said, this is the first time I've heard of it. I mean, he lied so effortlessly he, he we know now he had been aware of it for weeks yeah um well, well you mentioned right? the uh the the uh the montana um representative who won the election uh who right. beat up the reporter uh which is not normal behavior uh, even for republicans um uh, <laughs> sorry i had to get that in there but um but it raises this question of how has trump changed the psychology of society Robert J. Lifton introduced this term at our Yale conference, malignant normality, which I think is a brilliant term, actually, Mm -hmm. because we've been saying, or uh, I've been saying, you've been saying that Donald Trump suffers from malignant narcissism. But what happens when the leader of a country has malignant narcissism and starts to impose malignant normality, where his craziness becomes the new normal? No, I have a colleague... um... <clears throat> who's Latina and teaches in the English department at Syracuse University. And she said that after the election, she started getting hate mail and comments to her on the street that she had never experienced in her lifetime. So there is something about, about, well, I mean, I have a, I have a different, I mean, a different take on it, but um, oh, what's your- I, always, I, I always think of America as, really conflicted between its base primitive instincts and its higher ideals. And I, I, I'm very patriotic. I really love our, our country and our culture, even though I'm very critical of it. So when I think of President Obama being elected, I, I, I live up in Ithaca, New York, where I'm speaking to you from. And I remember speaking in a rural gas station, talking to an old white lady after Obama was elected. It was maybe the first month and I sort of asked her about him, and she said, you know, we're rooting for him. I mean, the country really stretched. They decided to vote for an African-American man, clearly mature. I mean, what a contrast. Rarely lost it. Um, wasn't affected by criticism. Was always open to other points of view. Was in a healthy long-term marriage. Um, and the country kind of stretched. They kind of put aside their kind of racist impulses and embraced this different person. Parts of it. It's like a rubber band. Yeah, but 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 he really. I mean, he was elected. I mean, he really did rather well if you think about it, right? I mean, that those that that old white lady in the in the countryside of upstate New York. She she stretched. She she embraced him. 
And I think what we're seeing is the backlash. It's like a rubber band. It's like now the the person we now now we got someone who's gonna who's gonna stick it to everybody. Who's gonna tell those stupid Europeans where they can shove it and and is just a, you know bragging and talking talk, talking about how great he is. And I think that impulsivity, the aggressive quality, the way that the Trump. I, I was thinking of Corey Lewandowski leaving marks on that reporter's arm. Um, that kind, they're all kind of hoods, you know, like Paul Manafort. And these are, you know, the, these are pretty um, rough characters that he's attracted to. And look at the, look at the, uh, the, the world, the tyrants he's attracted to, and he wants to hang out with, not just Putin, but, but um, anybody but with a power military is kind of his sort of guy. Yeah, <laughs> another thing. gangster. It, another gangster. It makes him feel better about himself. He's in. That's why he loves generals. He likes being associated with powerful people. He had a show where where the punchline was, you're fired. I mean, that's really where he's at. And yeah, it's affecting the culture. The president always does. So in a way, these dictators, uh, following what you're saying, it's almost like they represent a kind of ego ideal for him, the strong man, the uh, uberman, you know, the superman, yeah. Ala Nietzsche. Yeah, it, it, but it shores up that sense of himself as all-powerful to keep himself away from that fear of being nothing. So in some ways it's sort of like, would you say, it's like Hitler forming an alliance with Stalin and Mussolini, that these birds of a feather have a way of kind of have, getting together in a room and dividing up the territory among the... the well, yeah, the, I mean, the I think they all... Yeah, those guys all identified with each other. Of course, they, these those fascist leaders. I mean, they were riding a really powerful wave, right? I mean, it was a really. I mean, I never thought that time would ever return, and we're you know we're seeing at least with with Trump kind of a pendulum is swinging back to that kind of wanting a powerful leader like that, and and I think that's the result of Islamic terrorism is really destabilizing everyone psychologically and also politically. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really, it's yeah. doing, it, it's doing its job yeah. and, um, and, and provoking a kind of strongman response, unfortunately. Um, that's a very, very, very unsettling time. Well, uh, Dr. Siegel, this has been extremely illuminating. Um, uh, is there anything else you wanted to say? Or uh, I know when I do interviews, always afterwards, I think, oh, I should have said so-and-so. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you'll think, you'll think of that after we hang up. But is there anything else you wanted to say? You know, I, <clears throat> um, I guess what I, I, I think that the public has to begin by listening to um, the way that he responds to criticism. I mean, I think, I think he fired Comey because he didn't like what Comey said about him. I don't think it was like, let me fire him to stop this investigation. That's way too thoughtful. This was something impulsive. And if the, if the, if the country can begin to notice that, that will be a groundwork for saying he is not up to this job. He is a danger. But until we that can be really understood, then the alternate facts and the fake media stories will um, will shore up the other version of Trump, which is that he's just a loudmouth who who means well and is fighting for fighting for us. Quote, so we have to educate the public. Absolutely, over and over again. You know, you mentioned Goldwater, and I was thinking, the Goldwater was sort of like the boy who cried wolf. You know, all the psychiatrists said he was crazy, and he wasn't, and so it was wrong. Mm. And now the real wolf is here. <coughs> <laughs> I, think, I think it was the psychiatrists at the time who were crying wolf. Yeah, exactly. But right, now there right. is a wolf, and we're not allowed to cry. We're supposed to well, stifle ourselves like Edith Bunker. I, uh, <laughs> yes, I'm sure Archie would have been for, for Trump. <laughs> yeah, no, he's been one of the 35% who stuck with him no matter what. <laughs> Listen, you have done an amazing job at starting this movement. And the thing about about teaching about psychological things is you have to do it over and over again. It takes a long time. Human beings are resistant to thinking about their own minds. We don't like to think of us as complicated. We like to think that we're just totally in control and we just do what we want. But actually, it's much more complicated than that. As, 
as everyone really knows when you think about how we feel when we've had a loss or or when we get married or when we um, something important happens to us we're complex and we need to help the the public to understand that well, thank you, Dr. Siegel, and your voice will be one more repetition in the <laughs> voice of reality. Let us hope I'm, it gets through. Excellent. I'm standing by. All right. Thank you, Harry. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.